behind the net. Centers. Flat. Tries to Clark. John. Oh! Rebound! Score! Everybody, it's Isaiah. Just reminding you that FlyersNittyGritty.com and the OMB podcast are brought to you by Summit Public Adjusters. Hey, do you have damage to your home? Not sure who to call? We suggest that you call Summit Public Adjusters before your insurance company. Dealing with your insurance company can be very stressful. Let Summit take the stress out of the claims process. From storm damage to your roof, to toilet overflows, to broken pipes and fires, Summit gets you the most money for your repairs. So next time Mother Nature leaves you in need of repairs, call Summit Public Adjusters at 215-752-0560 or visit summitpubladjusters.com. Licensed in PA and New Jersey. And we are back. It is Isaiah. Welcome to the OMB Podcast, episode number 132. The practice games are over. The Flyers are going to play in four days at home against the Vancouver Canucks. The NHL season is here. Chef is not here, but he'll be back hopefully next week. But we do have with us tonight the great Dan Silver. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. I'm ready for the season to start. Oh, aren't we all? And with us, from the Athletic Philadelphia from Broad Street Hockey, who talked with us a few months ago about what a perfect offseason for the Flyers might look like. Well, he's back with us. We have Charlie O'Connor. Hey, doing uh, doing okay. It's good, to, uh, it's good to be back on the show. Thanks for having me again, guys. Yeah, always a pleasure. Uh, Dan, let me turn it over to you. So, you know, the first thing I want to ask about, and this is not – completely flyers related although it sort of is is you know charlie likes tweeting about music um <laughs> the flyers one thing that's really been on the tops of people's minds is the flyers are doing a new goal song this year they announced three finalists uh you know my choice I, of the three ones i kind of like tarzan boy the other options are a real big fish song that i never knew even existed and uh like a, a techno ballad uh this girl so charlie of those three what do you think, what would you pick, and what do you think is going to get selected? Uh, I am not into the, uh, the This Girl remix. I don't know. It just it, The funny thing is I, I have a feeling that might be the one the Flyers players like because it has very much a like pregame skate vibe that they would throw on that playlist. Um, the other two, I mean, they're fine. You know, they're, they both have some, you know, like – crowd participation or whatever and they just feel more goal songy i don't know um I, i'm not in love with any of them but I, the, the first two would be fine for me I, I people would would ask me a lot like what do you think the goal song should be and i just didn't really have a uh you know i didn't really have a set opinion my thing was more like if it's good i'll know it's good immediately and none of them really gave me that wow this is an amazing goal song type of vibe so you know i i think Probably those first two, Tarzan Boy and and the Real Big Fish one, they're probably both better than Feel the Shake. So at least we're going to have an improvement. That that's kind of the way I'm looking at it. Yeah, I, I had the same feeling because I wasn't even thinking about that this girl song, and then I saw the list and I was like, I wonder if some of the Flyers players kind of like planted that like is is something they might want. I mean, the one I really wanted, which they did play, I think after an Ivan Provorov overtime goal, was. Um, what the Eric Cripps song uh, "Call on Me"? I th- I heard that and I'm like, you know what? This would be great. But oh, I know. yeah, yeah. Oh, you mean Valerie I by Steve Win- uh, Winwood? Yeah, I mean that one. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's got, it's got the, the the hook from that song, right? 
Yep. Yeah, it's got the hook of a song from Steve Winwood. I heard that, and maybe it was because I was excited that they won an overtime, you know, preseason game, and they were playing it, and you kind of like, I could, I, I felt like, man, this would be pretty good. But, um, you know, I, I, I guess we'll see. So, do you know, are they? And I'll be there Friday night. Really excited. It's gonna be my first um, home opener in a while that I've gone to. Um, are they just gonna? Are we gonna find out like after the first goal, or are they gonna announce it before then? That's a really good question. And I'll be honest with you. I have not talked to anyone in the Flyers organization to ask whether they plan to reveal it, you know, that day on social media or if they just reveal it when the first goal happens, if the Flyers score. Hopefully the Flyers will score at least one goal on Friday. Um, but uh, I kind of think it would be more fun if they waited until the very first the very first goal. So it's kind of like a big surprise, but it's not something I've really been focused on trying to like, you know, check with sources to see when they're going to reveal the goal song. It's not been <laughs> yeah. a priority. Um, I, Carly, so I, don't, I, I don't know for sure. I, I don't know for sure what their plan is. So, okay. So let's talk about the Flyers a little bit. Um, you know, this is, I think this is the first season in a while, maybe what, eight years that I hear that they're, they're opening the season at home. Is that? Yes. It's been a long time. Well, so it's one of those things where, it's the first time I believe, I think I talked about this on BSH radio last week. I think it's the first time since 2013 when they've played both at home at their, for their season opener and in front of fans, because last year the season opener was at home. It was just at an empty arena. And the, uh, the year before the flyers were technically the home team, but they were playing in a different country. So really they've actually been the home team the last three years. It's just, this is the first time that fans are actually able to, you know, Philadelphia fans, I'll say, and people from the area, you know, are able to go to the game without traveling overseas or, you know, breaking COVID protocol to sneak into the arena. <laughs> right. So, you know, so one of the things that I've kind of been thinking about is, you know, the Flyers turned over 25% of their roster. They've got a lot of new guys. They're trying to integrate those guys into AB systems. Um, it's going to take some time probably for them to gel. The, the, you know, the, the one main need that they didn't really fill in the off season was, you know, a, a, a third, a legitimate third line center. And so yeah. of course we kind of get penalized by that with, uh, Kevin Hayes's injury. So they're looking really thin down the middle to start the season, but, one of my thoughts was that, okay, you look at the early season schedule for this team, all right, the first two games you're hosting the Canucks and you're hosting the Seattle Kraken. Now, you know, those those should be wins. Then you look and, okay, you've got the Bruins and the Panthers, but, but then, you know, you're going on the road. You're playing the Canucks, the Flames, the Coyotes. Those teams are not, again, that great. So it's almost like the early part of the schedule is sort of ideal for a team that – has some injury issues and maybe is looking to try and get some chemistry going at the beginning of the season. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it, as you mentioned, it is maybe not ironic, but it's just very flyers ish that, you know, Chuck Fletcher honestly did a very good job of addressing almost every single roster need. Now, you know, whether he addressed it sufficiently remains to be seen, but at the very least he addressed them all. And then the only roster need that he didn't address really was the center thing, you know, having a clear cut third line center. And of course that's the one thing that blows up in their face before camp even begins with the Kevin Hayes injury uh, or with the Kevin Hayes surgery. Um, is it something where they're just going to try to ride it out? I mean, yeah, they are, but I guess they don't really have much of a choice. Like what were they going to do they had two two top six centers one of them got hurt you know the one thing they've kind of lucked out in and we'll see if this plays out in the season is that honestly Derek Broussard has looked pretty good in camp um better than I thought he was going to especially given the fact that you know dating back to last fall you know the fall of 2020 you know Derek Broussard had kind of acknowledged publicly that he really didn't think that he was a an NHL center anymore you know he had spent time at, at center with the Islanders then they moved him to wing, and he played significantly better. And when he got signed by the Arizona Coyotes uh, late in uh, in that off season, um, he basically said that he thought he was, you know, a winger now. You know that he wasn't really an NHL center at this point. And then he had to play center a bit in Arizona because the Coyotes were a mess. And you know, as usual, they just didn't have a lot of talent. So he played center there, and he didn't look bad. 
And then the Flyers signs him, and they put him back at center. And he's honestly looked pretty good. I think he's shown some legitimate chemistry with uh, with Cam Agassin in particular, um, which, I mean, that dates a little bit back to their time together with Columbus. But they didn't play a ton together back then. And, and Atkinson wasn't yet the player he was going to become. So it's hard for me to say that, like, that's residual chemistry. It's just that they seem to have clicked. And, I mean, the Flyers are going to need Broussard in particular, I think, to, to kind of exceed expectations to start the year if they're going to want to survive the Kevin Hayes injury because you know we, we all know what Scott Lawton is you know we know that Scott Lawton can hold down the fort at center we know he's not a game changer of the position but we know that you know he'll be decent Broussard is, is, a, is a piece where you know he's now in the middle he's either you know depending on how you want to look at those those middle two lines he's either a top sixer or at least a middle sixer um and if he can if he can provide solid results for the weeks where Hayes is out, they should be okay. If he's a mess and he doesn't look like he's capable of, of holding down the Ford and playing that position, then the Flyers are going to be in trouble. And I know you said, you know, that Vancouver and Seattle should be wins. You know, first off, anything can happen in the NHL. Secondly, like, you know, Vancouver's kind of in the same boat as the Flyers, where they took a big step back last year. They're looking for a bounce back season. And the Kraken, I mean, Maybe they're in a tough spot now because it appears a lot of their players got thrown on the you know, COVID protocol this week. Although if they're all vaccinated, they very well could be back in time you know, for the, the, the game against the Flyers, which I believe is Monday. But I'm not saying those games are necessarily going to be easy. I mean, the Kraken, I don't think, are are a bad team. And Vancouver's got talent and they've got their, their two best players back. So uh, to me, Broussard is going to be key to surviving you know, the, the Hayes absence to start the year because if he can't cut it, they're going to be in trouble down the middle and they very well could end up looking like a one line team. So, you know, conceptually um, thinking about this team and watching the preseason games, obviously it's difficult because you'll have games where the Flyers have their full squad and they're playing against teams that are playing, you know, have kind of a split squad going or the Flyers have a split squad and they're playing against like the Bruins full starting lineup, but just watching the team and especially with the Hayes injury, I, the vibe I was kind of getting was we might be looking at a team that's going to need to play pretty well defensively, get good, get good goaltending and, you know, find ways to score goals, maybe with the new look power play with Keith Yandel and maybe win some, you know, low scoring games. I'm sure there'll be games where they, you know, they, they put up a bunch of offense, but it, it seems like goal scoring could be somewhat of an issue with this team. Um, I did kind of like the way that, in a lot of the games that they were kind of playing defensively. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? Like as conceptually as a team, like what are the ways that this team's going to kind of have to win games? And do you think they're capable of that? Well, I guess we'll see. Um, you never really know, you know, it could, in, in small samples, weird things happen. You know, maybe the flyers break out to this, this deluge of goals because, the top line goes crazy or some random bottom sixer gets off to an incredible start or the power plays red hot. Like you really never know. I do agree though, that, you know, the offense does looks a little suspect right now because it was so much of, of your, your ability to drive up offense is really driven by your centers. You know, I'm not saying that wingers aren't valuable and there are some wingers like Mark stone who are basically like second centers, but so much of the quality of a line is driven by that guy down the middle. And, you know, the Flyers are in a tough spot now because they don't have that quality. And, you know, maybe they could get it if they moved Giroux back to center, but I don't get the sense they want to do that. I think that's kind of like an in case of emergency break glass sort of thing. So, yeah, they could they could run into some scoring issues without a doubt. Um, you know, Hayes hurt. Hayes being out hurts because it really weakens that second line. Um Wade Allison being out hurts because I really thought he was going to play a big role. Um, you know, maybe not you know, scoring a ton of goals, but I thought he was going to provide real value, uh, you know, in the third line role, assuming he made the team. And now he's out of the picture for the foreseeable future, uh, which hurts them um, pretty dramatically. Because I, I don't think he's going to be coming back anytime soon. So yeah, there could be some, some goal scoring issues that said, they still do have talent. I mean, they still have that first line should be good. You know, the, the Drew Couture connecting line, it should score. As you said, Yandel should help the power play. I think he will. I think he's a lot more of the type of player up top that they want, you know, more of a distributor. Drew actually said 
about a week ago in an availability that, you know, the thing that he's, that Yandel brings to the table that's different is just a real passing mentality, which is from my understanding, exactly what the, the front office and the coaching staff has wanted from, from that guy up top for quite a while now. So I think that'll help. It fits with kind of their philosophy that they want to, uh, that they want to push uh, on the power play. And hopefully that will lead to better results. But you know, they still have guys like Joel Farabee, James Van Riemsdyk, Cam Atkinson. I mean, they have guys that can score. So this isn't this isn't an Arizona Coyote situation where, you know, you look at that roster and you're just like, yikes, where's the talent? But it could be a problem if, as I said, you know, somebody like Derek Rossard doesn't step up in the early going and really exceed expectations. You know, the, the expectations that come from him being you know, a guy in his mid thirties who presumably is past his prime. And, you know, over short samples, guys like that can exceed expectations. And if he does, the flyers will be okay. Or if, you know, Scott Lawton has a great start to the year, the flyers could be okay, but they're going to need one or two guys. I think in the absence of Hayes to perform better than maybe is reasonable to expect, because if they don't, I do agree. They could have some trouble scoring. Yeah. So yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Isaiah. Yeah, I, I was just going to say about, you know, one of the players they were hoping could step up who didn't seem to have his timing together and maybe was a little bit tentative with all the time he had off was Morgan Frost. He's going to be with the Lehigh Valley Phantoms. But it, it sounds like they really want him to just get his game together and to get off some of the rust. What is your impression about their plan for Morgan? Yeah, the Morgan Frost situation is fascinating to me because I was under the impression from the conversations I had, you know, with people connected to the organization heading into the start of camp. So this was before the Hayes surgery, you know, became a thing. I was under the impression that the Flyers were operating under the assumption that Morgan Frost was going to need AHL time, that their base assumption was that there's no way that this guy after playing four meaningful periods of hockey in the last 18 months, is going to be ready to step in and be the Morgan Frost that they believe he is as a player. They thought, you know, he was going to have a lot of rust to shake off. He was going to struggle to get his timing back, to get his rhythm back, and he was going to need some time in the in, in the AHL. I think that was a big reason why they ultimately decided to sign Derek Broussard, because they, they decided that it just wasn't reasonable to expect that they were going to get the real Morgan Frost in the beginning of the year. And they wanted to kind of give themselves some leeway where they didn't have to force him into that role. So that was where I thought the organization was at. Then the Hay surgery happens out of nowhere, right before the start of camp. And suddenly the entire vibe around Morgan Frost chances changed because he immediately gets pushed up into a scoring role every single day of camp. And suddenly the the perception coming out of camp was that this is Morgan Frost's spot to lose. And I think honestly what it was was a little bit of wishful thinking on the part of the Flyers because I don't think they just threw their previous assumptions out the window. I think they were just hoping against hope that Frost was going to figure it out quick enough to be able to replace Hayes because they know, as we just said, they know they're going to have some trouble scoring, you know, if, if they potentially turn into just a one line team and Morgan Frost, if he plays up to his potential could have solved that problem because he has the highest scoring upside of anybody they could play in that role aside from maybe Giroux. But then that creates the problem of, you know, then the top line isn't as strong. So they like to keep him up in the spot where he's going to provide the most value. So I think they were just really hoping that Frost, it was just going to click for him quicker than they thought. And then when it didn't, Fletcher had to make the hard call of, I think will be better in the long term, and, and Frost will be better in the long term if he figures it out down in the AHL rather than trying to, you know, throw him into the deep end while he's trying to knock off the rust. And then maybe he struggles, maybe he loses confidence, then you have to send him down. And then he's not Morgan Frost until January rather than November. Um, so I think that's really what drove it. But I don't think I don't think it was as disappointing to the flyers that frost didn't figure it out quick enough to earn the job as it may have seemed to the fans, because I think the flyers came into camp knowing that it was highly unlikely that Morgan frost was going to just hit the ground running and, and be great from the start. I think they always had the base level concern that it was going to take time for him to figure it out. And they ended up just kind of falling back onto that base assumption. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. 
No, I was just going to say, and so, I mean, it's got to be a good sign that, I, what, a couple nights ago, I don't know if it was last night or a couple nights ago, Morgan Frost, uh, you know, playing on a line with Tyson Forrester with the Phantoms, uh, had two goals and an assist. He scored the uh, game-winning goal on a nice give-and-go with, with Forrester. And so I guess, you know, I I'm wonder, find myself wondering, like, okay, if Frost starts tearing it up in the AHL, um, I wonder how long it'll be before he's back up. It's a good question. Um, I get the sense that, you know, they'd like to have him down there for a little bit. Um, but, but you never know. I mean, you go back to what happened with Joel Farabee when he got sent down. I mean, he wasn't down long because it was just abundantly clear that he was too good for the AHL. I remember covering a game that he played uh, right before he got called up uh, in Lehigh Valley. And he was just on another level. Like it just kind of, you know, anybody who was watching those games could tell that Joel Farabee was too good for the, for that level. And if Frost can do the same, then sure, he could race back up there. But I get the sense that when they call Morgan Frost back up, they're calling him back up to, to, to have the job and keep the job. So they want to be really sure that he's, you know, that he's ready to go. They're not going to, like, call him up for a game, see how he looks, and if he doesn't look good, they're going to send him down. Like, when he gets brought back up, it's going to be for the long haul. So – if he figures it out before Kevin Hayes comes back, then yeah, maybe they do it. Maybe they bring up Frost or whatever, and they figure, well, you know, after five games, Frost is ready. Sure, let's let's throw him in that role, the role we originally hoped we were going to be able to throw him in, you know, at the end of camp. Um, but then that also plays into the, the Derek Broussard situation where, you know, let's say it takes Frost a month to, to, to convince them. But by then, Kevin Hayes is back. And Derek Broussard looks pretty darn good as like a third line middle six center. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it could. If that's the case, you know, maybe they keep Frost down a little bit longer because they say, well, you know, we're pretty happy with where we're at. And, you know, Hayes is back. So that's his job. And Broussard's hanging in there as the third line center. So let's keep it going until Broussard struggles and we maybe have to move him to wing. And then we, uh, you know, we could put Frost back there. So there's a lot of moving parts. I, I don't. I'm not expecting Frost to come back immediately. I know fans are hoping that's the case, and obviously that's the best-case scenario because it means that Frost is playing quite well in the minors, and that's sort of what everyone's kind of hoping for. Um, but I don't necessarily think they're going to rush him. Like, there were some people, I think, in the wake of him being sent down that thought, well, maybe they're just going to have him play the preseason games, and if he's scoring in the, pre the AHL preseason games, they'll call him right up for the season opener. Like, I, I don't think that was ever a realistic possibility. I think they want to see him sustain strong levels of play in the AHL for a bit, but in the end, it's going to be up to him. I mean, if he's really killing it down there, maybe they do expedite the process. Yeah. I mean, the, the interesting thing about what you just said is that they don't want to bring him up until he's ready to be in the NHL for the long haul. Yeah. Here's the thing though. And I'm as big a Morgan Frost fan as you'll find. Like I think his offensive upside is, I really think when he finds his confidence, like he has, almost like a Giroux-esque type of offensive upset, probably not that high, but I just think his offensive IQ is insane. Um, but by saying, you know, they're not going to bring him up until he's ready for the long haul, I still don't think any of us know if he is going to be ready for the long haul. Like, I That's think fair. he could he could tear up the AHL and they could bring him up and we could still see that same kind of, like, tentative player. You know what I mean? No. So you just sort of... I, there's no way to find out if he's ready for the long haul in the NHL without giving it to him, but he's got to earn it, you know? Yeah. And that's a totally fair point. And, and I think more or less what I'm, what I'm trying to get across is it just kind of comes down to his play in the AHL. Like obviously a guy can tear it up in the AHL and then he call it gets called up to the NHL and turns out that it just doesn't translate. And that's always the possibility with Morgan Frost. Maybe he's, you know, he ends up turning into just one of those great AHL scorers who doesn't, isn't able to do the same things in the NHL. I don't think that's the case, but you can't rule out the possibility when he hasn't yet established himself as an NHL. -er. I just think that they want to see him, you know, consistently scoring at the AHL level and also, you know, driving play and, and pushing the pace and doing all the things they're looking for him to do. And, and I, I think in the end it's going to happen. It's just a matter of how quickly it happens. And, yeah, you're absolutely right that there's a there's there's an unknown. You know, obviously anybody you call from the AHL, you don't know for sure that they're 100 percent ready. But if they're killing it in the AHL, you can – feel decently confident that they're at least ready for an extended look in the NHL. And I know Frost has gotten looks before, but I get the sense that this is, this is maybe not a make or break year for him because he'll still be a skilled player. But in terms of his place on the flyers, like this is a year where, you know, 
the spot's there. It's there for him when he's ready. And the hope is that at some point he seizes it and runs with it. And I mean, if he doesn't seize it and run with it, then the Flyers are going to have to, you know, make some some tough decisions, whether it be at the trade deadline or in the off season, as to you know how they're going to address that center spot because, you know, a Couturier Hayes one two is 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 a good start, but the best teams in the league have three good centers, and I think the hope is that Frost can be that third good center. But he has to do it. And if he doesn't do it this year, then you start wondering, like, how much longer really can we wait? So I think the hope on the flyer side is that he will be able to do it at some point this year. It's just they don't know when it's going to happen. Yeah, well, the Flyers did get some reinforcement today with the center right winger Patrick Brown claimed off waivers from the Vegas Golden Knights. I would imagine, Charlie, that this late in the game for a team that already maybe lacking a little bit of cohesion. He was somebody on their list of guys that they were going to claim if he got let go. So what what's your opinion of that, and what do you think he adds and why the Flyers made that move? Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I assume that he's just a guy who they like. You know, they like his talent level. He's, from my understanding, he's very much the kind of person who um, sort of fits with that whole uh, – locker room makeover that the Flyers did this summer where he's super high character. Um, he was captain of the, the Boston College team he played on with Kevin Hayes. He was captain down in Charlotte in the AHL. He was captain last year in the AHL for uh, you know for the, for the Golden Knights. Um, so I think he plays into that. And I think they, they like the talent. You know, they like the fact that he's, you know, a very coachable guy. And I guess they just preferred him to Garrett Wilson. Um, I... I'm iffy on just like picking up a guy and throwing him in there for game one. If that's the plan now, now I guess that's the plan. Un- unless the, the one possibility here that could happen is if, um, if they place Kevin Hayes on long-term IR tomorrow, um, you know, and, and kind of go that route, then maybe they call somebody else back up and they use this guy, um, you know, Patrick Brown as an extra forward, because it just seems weird to me that you're going to claim a guy and, th- and throw him into the starting lineup for game one without having any sort of, um, you know, not having gone through camp, not knowing the system, not having any chemistry with, with line mates, you know, maybe you can build it over the next couple of days in practice, but it, it seems, it seems like a stretch. So, so I kind of wonder if, you know, there will be some more maneuvering tomorrow. Um, just, just, you know, theorize, and this isn't coming from, from a source, but it, I'm not saying they wouldn't do it. It just strikes me as weird to run into next, um, you know, to the first game of the year with a, you know, Patrick Brown, Nate Thompson, uh, Nicholas Albuquerque Bell fourth line, um, when that really isn't something that you've been able to try at all during camp. And, you know, Elaine Vino, the start of camp made a big deal out of how important it was to develop chemistry. And now you're just throwing this out there. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how it plays out, but, I don't think, you know, Patrick Brown is, is an awful player, but he's probably, you know, more of just a depth guy. And if they were to waive him again, there's no reason why, you know, the Golden Knights wouldn't just reclaim him. Um, and, and we go through this this whole back and forth again. So the Flyers are claiming him with the goal of of keeping him, I'm guessing. They must value him you know, at least to a degree. Um, but I just I'm not totally sure if he's going to even be in the starting lineup for, for Friday. We'll see how it plays out. No, I was just going to say you mentioned the starting lineup for Friday. So two guys that have been absent at the last two practices, I don't know if I think maybe they were Saturday and Sunday, um, but two guys who were absent from the last two practices, Rasmus Ristolain and, and Ryan Ellis, obviously two guys that the Flyers are really counting on um, to help uh, buoy the the defense pairings. Ellis on the first pairing with Provorov and Ristolainen on the second pairing with Sanheim. You know, considering Ellis's injury history, I mean, I know we're not really, I guess, supposed to be concerned about guys missing practice, you know, practices the week before the season starts. But or have you heard anything or you have any concerns about those two guys, you know, missing practice? And I guess we'll find out tomorrow morning, Tuesday morning, if if either one of them isn't in practice. But um, I felt like I was a little more concerned than than most people about those guys missing practices, especially Ellis. Do you have any insight on that? I mean, the Flyers keep saying that they're they're basically fine, that they're banged up, you know, but it's no big deal. They'll be back on the ice Tuesday. If they're not back on the ice tomorrow, then, yeah, it becomes a legitimate concern because today was a uh, 
you know, today was an off ice day. They did, they were doing some team bonding. Um, and if he can't, you know, if either of either one of them, if Ellis or Ristolainen, you know, can't hit the ice on Tuesday, then, then it gets concerning. But that said, I mean, they're definitely benefiting from the fact that they have a late start to the season. You know, there's, there's games that are going to be happening all week and the flyers don't actually start playing until Friday. So they get a couple extra days to recuperate. And, you know, more, what I've been hearing is that, you know, they're just kind of playing it safe with these guys, but you never know. I mean, sometimes stuff, stuff lingers. And to me, to me, if there was a really big problem, I feel like they may have done a little bit more gymnastics with regards to how they set up this lineup. Um, but I guess they could theoretically just, you know, drop Hayes on long-term IR if worst case scenario happens and then call up a defenseman or two. Um, you know, if that proves completely necessary. So uh, there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of moving parts right now. That's the thing. There's, there's a lot of moving parts, but I, I would expect at this point that Ellis and Rissa Lyon will be, be in the lineup for Friday. And they did, York was already sent down, right? Yeah, York was sent down. Zamul is still technically with the team because he was placed on a season opening IR. My understanding with Zamul is that he will be cleared physically in the next couple of days. And then once he's cleared physically, he'll be pulled off the uh, you know the season opening IR and just reassigned to the minors. I just, he's, he, he actually practiced on Sunday, but I got the sense that um, you know, obviously he would have had to be medically clear and I guess he's just not quite there yet. Uh, but once he is, I mean, he'll be, he'll go back down and yeah, York was sent down today, which was always what was going to happen once it became obvious that he wasn't, um, it, he wasn't ready to beat out one of the six guys. You know, that was the only way he was going to make the team. If one of the six guys either got hurt or he just had such an amazing camp that, you know, he pushed out Keith Yandel and it became pretty abundantly clear early on that that wasn't going to happen and they yeah. want cam york to play games so he's going down unless somebody gets hurt and then they call him up and drop him in the top six okay. yeah just uh just a note to complete that thought uh, nick sealer jackson cates in addition to york and, and garrett wilson all assigned uh, to the phantoms so just to catch up on that but charlie look we, we were watch the exhibition games and if carter hart was a positive in his limited action, the PK was probably a negative. Uh, what are your other impressions, kind of based on your article, w worry or not worry, <laughs> that you put out in The Athletic recently? Yeah, you know, Carter Hart, obviously, he looked quite good in, um, in his two appearances. There was that little scare where he had a maintenance day after a day off, but he he's back, and it seems like he's... You know, he'll be fine for for the start of the year and he's had a good camp you know he's looked sharp he he's looked um you know he's looked engaged with the play at all times you know he's yeah he's had it maybe a couple of days where he's letting a few goals at practices but for the most part he looks like carter hart again which is is a great sign and to me you know the goaltending in the end is what's going to make or break this team this season um in, at least in terms of them being you know con in contention for the playoffs like you can't you can't make the playoffs if your your team save percentage is, is 880. It's just not going to happen. So you know, getting Carter Hart back to to what he was before last year's disaster of a season is huge in terms of what the Flyers are going to be. Um, you mentioned the penalty kill. Yeah, it hasn't been great. The Flyers seem confident they can fix it. I guess we'll see. Um, beyond that, um, I've liked I, I liked what I saw out of Kateri and Giroux in camp. I liked what I saw out of Atkinson, especially as the preseason progressed. I thought he's looked more and more, you know, like the uh, the, the shoot first goal scorer that they thought they were acquiring for uh, for Jake Voracek. So um, I think that's that's something to be excited about. So you know, there's those things in terms of concerns. You know, we've we've already talked about the center problem. But to me, that's the biggest concern entering the year, aside from the lingering question of can they get the old Carter Hart back? Because, as I said, if if you don't have multiple good centers, you really risk yourself becoming a one line team. And, you know, unless, you know, Broussard and Lawton can step up in the early season, they really run that risk. And that's going to really hurt their, their attempts to, to score goals. So to me, that's, that's the, the big concern, you know, that then plays in a, to overall lineup depth, you know, scoring depth, which we already talked about, but um, definitely, uh, definitely reassured um, by how Carter Hart has looked. Um, which, uh, you know, as I said, to me, he's the, maybe not the only thing that has to go right, but if he, if it's, it's, it's not enough for just Carter Hart to be better, but if Carter Hart isn't better, nothing else matters, which is why to me, that's the most important part of the season is, is making sure Carter Hart is right and back to his old self, because if he's as bad or close to as bad as he was last year, the Flyers aren't going anywhere. 
So for me, one of the real positives that I've seen in the preseason ties in with one of what I thought was one of Chuck Fletcher's will look like one of his overarching kind of aims and goals for the off season was, you know, this team last year would have games like they get blown out by the Rangers, nine, nothing. And there just wasn't much of a response in game from the players or, you know, Scott Lawton would get pile drived into the ice off a face off. And there just wasn't really much of a response. And, and so to me, as much as they upgraded the talent on the ice, it seemed like Chuck Fletcher really wanted to kind of change the room a little bit and upgrade uh, to a team that might, you know, stand up for each other a little bit more. And we've certainly seen that in the offseason. I mean, there was the the Garrett Hathaway attempted elbow to Provorov's face. Ivan gets up. He punches him down to the ice. Hathaway gets up. He basically wants to fight Provorov. And I think it was maybe Broussard that jumped in. Yeah, yeah, it was um, Broussard. You know, and and you tweeted out a couple of days ago, you know, Sean Couturier says he's liked that the team has been sticking up for each other often in preseason games. He says it's important to have a team toughness mentality and he's seen that in the exhibition games. And I, I couldn't agree more with, you know, Couturier and that he says that. Um, I think it's great. I think it's going to lead to a more tight-knit, tight-knit group and I think it'll, you know, <laughs> lead to le- less fan complaining. Um, although I'm sure you know, us fans will find something to complain about. But I guess my question is, like, you've got Sean Couturier saying that, and I'm sure that he felt that way and Claude Giroux felt that way about last season. But, like, wh- where does that fall on last season? I mean, is that just you just kind of write it off to the weird pandemic season? Or, I, I don't know, it was just kind of confusing to me to, to see one of the leaders of the team say that because it just made me wonder, okay, well, what was the problem with last season? Why couldn't you guys stick up for each other? I just think in a lot of ways it was kind of the year from hell. Um, you know, I, I've never gotten the sense that the people, like, that I never gotten the sense that, like, everybody hated each other. I, I do think that in the grand scheme of things, you know, this team, they talked about it so much in 2019, 2020, that, you know, how tight this group was. And you, you still... You're know, talking to to guys after you know after practices this this off or this uh, preseason. You hear about you know the new guys talking about how tight everyone is. You know it's it's a great locker room. I just got the sense last year that you know when things went bad and and things started to break against the Flyers that everybody just got really really frustrated about everything and, and the knives came out to a degree. Um, you know there was there's there was definitely tension between the players and the coaches. Um, there was tension between certain players getting frustrated with usage, things like that. I mean, it just, you know, one thing I tweeted a couple days ago um, about last season is that in a lot of ways, last season was something of a stress test because there's 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 some sometimes you you can find yourself in a situation where like, Everything seems fine, but everything seems fine because everything's going fine. And you don't really figure out if there are cracks, you know, in the structure and in the foundation, you know, of an organization, of a team, whatever, until stuff starts to go bad. And then you find out just how strong that foundation was. And I think what they found out was that when stuff started going bad last year, that they had sort of convinced themselves like not just as as a team, but as an organization, the front office and everything, it sort of convinced themselves that like, oh, like this team is so tight. You know, they they rallied around Oscar Lindblom last year. Kevin Hayes brought the locker room together. Look at how close this group is. They're actually they're a group that's actually better than the sum of their parts because they're just so close. And what ended up happening was they had this stress test of a year where you have you know the COVID pause, you have a demanding schedule, you know the you had the goaltending started to struggle, you had all the challenges of living through the pandemic, and what happened was I think they they found out that there was a lot more issues going on below the surface. You know, there were a lot of guys who were, you know, maybe not thrilled with, with the way things were going, but they were keeping their mouth shut because the season, because the team was doing well. So it's like, well, I can't complain. Well, then when stuff starts going bad, then the people start complaining and then, then, you know, it just gets worse. And I think, you know, they failed the stress test last year. And one of the things that Chuck Fletcher said, um, in a couple interviews, he first said it in an interview with um, with Step Driver of VSH Radio, and he said it on the record to everyone a few weeks later, was that he thought that, because there was always, 
one of the things that was fascinating to me about last year was that, you know, guys like Drew and guys like Couturier, they really were playing fine. You know, maybe they could have played a bit better, but like Drew, I thought had a pretty darn darn good year. Couturier was fine. JVR was mostly good. The older guys really weren't the issue. It was the younger guys who pretty much as a whole just sort of fell apart. And Fletcher essentially said that I got the sense that when things started to go bad, we maybe didn't have enough leaders in the locker room that could really stabilize things. And some people took that as a shot at the, across the bow called Drew. And I don't think it was intended to to be. I think sort of Fletcher's point was that Drew is a lead by example guy. That's what he is. So when stuff went bad, Drew was just like, well, I'm just going to lead by example and I'm going to, you know, give 110% every game and I'm going to be engineering these comebacks and I'm going to drag people into the fight. And for whatever reason, he kept doing that and people weren't getting dragged into the fight. And I think what Fletcher kind of came to the conclusion of was that Okay, we've got our lead by example guys in Drew. Couturier is a bit more vocal than Drew, but he's not, you know, he's not a super duper rah rah kind of guy. That it's not sufficient just to have those lead by example guys. We need other voices. You know, we needed a Matt Niskanen type last year, and they didn't have him. You know, they needed maybe a guy more like Heath Yandel, where they thought Hayes could be that guy, but then Hayes had a year from hell. He was bad on injury, so he wasn't as peppy as he used as he used to be, and the whole thing kind of collapsed. So that's why I think a lot of the moves they made were focused on like, okay, let's really insulate ourselves and let's add a bunch of guys where if, if, if stuff goes bad again, it's not just like Claude Drew playing extremely hard and hoping everybody follows him. It's Drew doing that. And it's Couturier doing that, but it's also, you know, Ryan Ellis, maybe, you know, saying important things in the locker room after a game, you know, it's, it's Keith Yandel keeping things light. It's Cam Atkinson keeping things light. You know, that, that was, you know, it's wrist aligning with his intensity, you know, that, that, that keeps people, keeps people going. I just think that, you know, they just got so sick of the season that it almost just became like, do I really have to like, like by yeah. the end? I just, I just think, you know, it was less like we don't care about our teammates and more like, what's the friggin' point? Like, it's almost like nihilism set in that locker room. And, uh, and I think their, their, their hope is that the guys they add it, that'll make sure that even if things were to go bad again, because you're going to have bad runs during the course of a season, even if things go bad again, that this particular group with the additions they've made, isn't going to let it fester and isn't going to let it spiral the way it did last year. Yeah, it, it speaks to Elliot Freeman's uh, 32 thoughts. And he did, you know, p points three and four there about a spiral of negativity. We couldn't escape. Yeah. And very well, uh, people ought to check that out. Talks about Carter Hart, talks about everything. Like, you summed it up very well, though. And, but that points things toward Elaine Vigneault. And I would think that, you know, the Athletic did a little <laughs> – poll among their uh, staff. I don't know if, uh, yeah, you must have been included on this. Like, who was the first coach that was going to be fired? And Vigneault came in second to Travis Green. And it, after what A.V. went through last year, Charlie, I, where he looked like at times, like the players, like you said yourself, he didn't want to be there. This is really paining him to go through this. If the Flyers really get off to a rough start, and, and it's um, December 1st, right after Thanksgiving. It, could he be in trouble? Yeah, I, I, I do absolutely believe he could be in trouble. But it it has less for me to do with all that stuff. And and I'm not saying that stuff wasn't real. Um, you know, There definitely was tension between the players and the coaches. And there are absolutely some players that A.V. rubs the wrong way. I mean, you saw today with uh, with Eric Gustafson. Now, granted, Eric Gustafson did not play good hockey. He did not deserve to be playing. But there are players that don't particularly appreciate, you know, Elaine Vigneault and the way he coaches. That's a fact. You know, obviously, we saw it with Robin Lehner. He clearly, you know, he yeah, wasn't even coached by Vigneault, and he doesn't like him. Um, but to me, the, the bigger reason why Vigneault is on, I wouldn't quite say he's on the hot seat, because that implies that, like, they're going to fire him at the first sign of trouble. I don't think that's the case. But here's here's the way I look at it. The Flyers this offseason, you know, they very clearly took the approach of we're keeping the coaches. We don't think it's the coaches' fault that we think that the mix was flawed, both in terms of, you know, the talent 
mix. You know, your your defense was just poorly structured because you never replaced Matt Niskan and then Phil Myers dropped off a cliff um, and didn't step up to replace him. But also just the mix in the locker room was was there was something wrong with this. We got to change that. So they do they they do that. Fletcher has his big off season, does a ton of stuff. So now if you're Chuck Fletcher, you've addressed in as the way you saw fit, you addressed the roster. Now it's kind of like, okay, I did my job. Now the coach has got to do theirs because I don't think Chuck Fletcher is going to look at this after all the changes he made. He really put his stamp on this roster. I don't think he's going to look at this midway through the season. If the flyers are floundering, you know, in the the bottom half of the NHL and he's going to be like, you know what? I'm the one who screwed up. I got the wrong players. I made the wrong move. He's going to say, I built a team that I think is good. And if this coaching staff can't coach it to be good, maybe I need to get a new guy. So like, to me, it, it's less of, you know, and obviously if, if, if part of the problem there is, you know, Vino not clicking with his players again, and there's tension again, I mean, that'll play into a lack of success, but I think it's, it's less that like Vino is on the hot seat and more that, you know, it's kind of make or break time for that coaching staff because they were, you know, Fletcher was was clear that like well the coaches that wasn't let off the hook you know we had we had conversations about changes they need to make about adjustments they need to make in terms of how they coach and, and I don't doubt that was the case but functionally they were kind of let off the hook you know no one got let go the only change was that Ian LaPerriere got moved to the AHL and they hired literally one of Elaine Vigneault's best friends in the coaching industry in Daryl Williams so they're giving the coaching staff as much of a chance as possible to fix this. But the thing is, is that it's now on them. Like now it's, you know, it's make or break time for the coaches. If the coaching staff can't take this roster and turn it into a good team, the spotlight's on them because the roster's already been shook up. Now, the only thing to shake up aside from Chuck Fletcher losing his job would be to shake up the coaching staff, which is why I think there's a lot of pressure on Vino and his coaches. Hmm. So, you know, for me, another one of the, the, I guess this is more of a nice to have in the off season to add um, that this team doesn't really have, and you can see them kind of trying to get drafting guys like Tyson Forrester and and you know bringing in Atkinson is kind of like a quote unquote sniper, right? It's a term that gets overused and is you know a little bit ridiculous and unfair at times, but it is something that kind of this team could use more guys with a shoot first mentality, or you know that in a low scoring game can kind of break it open with an individual effort. So one of the guys for me, when I look at the roster that for the last number of years, I've kind of felt like, all right, this guy's on the precipice of becoming that kind of player, even though maybe he's not a shoot first player is, is Travis Konechny. And, you know, we go back to the season opener uh, in Switzerland, I think against the Blackhawks, he scored a couple of like ridiculous backhand roof goals. He's shown that ability at times and, and to me, even though, you know, he had his best statistical season for sure during the pandemic, it was kind of like a little bit of a, a breakout season for him. He took a step back last year, as a lot of the Flyers did. Um, and it's just the preseason. But I pers- I just haven't really seen enough from him so far in the preseason playing with Giroux and Couturier to make me think that that breakout season could be this year. I'm just kind of curious, like, what are your current thoughts on Konechny, where you think his career trajectory could go? Do you think he could still become kind of like that dynamic guy who's scoring the game-breaking goals? Um, what, what are you thinking about Konechny these days? Well, it's a big year for him, definitely. I mean, he absolutely took a step back last year. He knows that. Um, I think he treated the offseason with the uh, you know the requisite um, importance. He apparently came to camp in extremely good shape, and I specifically asked Vino after Friday's game what his thoughts were on Travis Konechny's preseason because, you know, I thought Giroux and Couturier have looked good. Um, you know, they look like themselves. They've been scoring, and Travis Konechny has one assist in four preseason games, and it's preseason. But you know, when you're on the top line and you're getting top power play unit time, you'd like to see them, you know, pop in a few more points. And Vino defended him, said, you know, yeah, the points haven't been there yet, but he's liked his, you know, what he's done off the puck and, you know, driving play into the offensive zone. He's liked his game. So we'll see. Um, The thing about Konechny that makes it tough on him is that 
Cam Atkinson, I mean, they could very easily flip-flop those guys. I mean, because Konecki right now looks like he's going to start the year on the top line, and that's a prime spot. You know, you're with Claude Giroux, you're with Sean Gattaria. You're probably going to score points. Well, if he doesn't score points, I mean, they have Cam Atkinson. They could easily uh, move up. You know, I know Atkinson has showed good chemistry with Broussard, but if you're a team that's, you know, maybe a little bit lacking on depth to start the year and your top line isn't scoring that much, well, they're going to make changes. So Konecki, it's important for him, I think, to get off to a quick start. And, you know, maybe he will. Maybe the preseason was just him working out the kinks. And when the games start becoming real, he'll pop in a couple goals and everything will be great. But, um, you know, I'm, for example, like I'm intrigued to see what Cam Atkinson can do on a line with Claude Giroux because I just, I, I'm really intrigued to see how, you know, Drew's playmaking would match up with Atkinson's scoring. Um, I get why they want to have Konechny on there in the beginning because that line has worked before. It has chemistry, and getting Konechny going is important. But if Konechny can't get going, you know, I don't think they're going to just stick with that. You know, out of uh, stubbornness. I mean, there's other options they could put. They could be can put Joel Farabee up there. He can play the right side. So this is a big start for for Konechny. I think he needs to get off to a good start. He needs to show that um you know that last year was kind of fluky maybe partially driven by um you know him not having the ability to get in as good condition as he maybe is this time because of you know the challenges of living in Canada during the pandemic um and then just you know having a down year you know maybe having too high expectations for himself and getting in his own head a little bit um he certainly could you know I, i'm still a connect me fan and his contract is fine for what he provides but it's a big year it's a big year for him to uh to, to show that you know 2019 2020 wasn't a fluke you know that that's that's his true talent level that wasn't a career year because right now if he has another okay season suddenly 2019 2020 does just look like a career year for a guy uh rather than a new normal yeah charlie you know you look at the flyers and how dependent they are on a couple eight hundred nine hundred thousand dollar players like Yandel and Broussard and I can't help but as we look toward making a projection and whether this team's good enough to be in the playoffs it just gnaws at me it just seems like the team we're going to see by the end of the year is not the one we're seeing right now either Frost is going to emerge or the Flyers are going to have to make some kind of move keeping in mind that even if Hayes comes back when you have these core muscle surgeries especially two in a row a lot of times it takes about 30 or 40 games to these for these players to find their their sea legs. So what's your thought about that? Yeah, the the Hayes concern is legitimate. You know, the the concern that, you know, we 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 saw it with Claude Giroux and Jake uh not Jake Voracek, uh Shane Gossespierre a few years ago after they had, you know, their surgeries and they didn't have two. They only had had one. Um the Flyers publicly, you know, are are acting like they think that Hayes will be back to uh back to his old self when he comes back they think that he might even be able to come back you know on the low end of his timeline closer to six weeks than eight but yeah it's a viable concern and i definitely share your opinion that the team that that ends this season is going to be significantly different than, than the team that begins it um i do think that wade allison will get back at some point um he may have to go to the ahl to you know find his game for a little bit but i i think he's an nhl player um i think frost will eventually make the team and if he doesn't crack the lineup you know, and the Flyers are in contention. I would expect the Flyers to be very aggressive at the trade deadline to try to get another center if, if Frost proves not to be capable of being that guy. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm with you that I think the the team at the end of the season, especially if the Flyers are good, um, I don't know if they're bad, then I guess it also could be different because they could trade some people. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm with you that, you know, this team – to begin the year, the the lineup, the roster, I do think it's going to look significantly different, even, you know, probably by like January. And I've been talking like, you know, April and May. I think by January, it's going to look different. Absolutely. So I, I guess we're at that point where we have to ask you and Dan, you know, by all means, weigh in. Uh, are they going to make the playoffs come by hook or by crook? In other words, they're going to trade, they're going to do whatever it takes. Because it really does seem like it's that kind of year where they – they have to do that. Are we going to kind of let Claude go and go in a different direction? They have to start reestablishing what they, the marker that they laid down in 20. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's an important year. You know, the, the, the Giroux factor definitely makes it an important year, but it's an important year because, you know, the Flyers with the way they approach the offseason. And I'm not just talking about the ads they made. Although that's a big part of it. I mean, when you're when you're trading away a young defenseman of Phil Myers, you know, when you're trading away first round picks, 
um, you know, for rest versus the lion. I mean, you have basically announced yourself as a win now team. You, you don't, you don't trade for a 30 year old Ryan Ellis with multiple years left on a, on a pretty substantial contract, unless you think you can win now. Um, and then you don't sign Sean Gutierrez to an eight year contract that takes him into his, his, you know, mid to late thirties. If you don't think you're ready to win now, um, if they don't win now, yeah, that, that's going to require the flyers to take a good hard look in the mirror and see what they want to do. And, you know, the, the fact that Jeru still hasn't signed adds another element to that because, you know, I think. The assumption is that Giroux will come back, that they'll find a way to make it work. I think Giroux wants to spend his career in Philadelphia. But if the Flyers stink this year, I wouldn't blame Claude Giroux if he's like, hey, I'd you know, kind of like to win a cup. And if you guys are going to you know, trade James Van Riemsdyk and trade away a bunch of people and look to kind of rebuild, like I don't know if I want to go through that again. Uh, so it's an important year for that regard. That said, I mean, I, I think they're going to make the playoffs. Um, if for no other reason that it seems like it's the trend, you know, they miss the playoffs and they make the playoffs. Um, but I also think that this is a better team, um, than it was last year, uh, you know, or that, that it played last year. Um, you know, I think that that last year was kind of, as I said, the season from hell and that, you know, even if just Carter Hart plays better, the flyers will certainly be in the playoff mix. Uh, but I also think just a lot of guys played under their true talent level and they're going to bounce back. Um, that said, it's not going to be easy because the Metro is tough. The Eastern Conference is tough. I mean, it's going to be a war to, to get in the playoffs. And while I think the Flyers will ultimately make it in, um, they might get off to something of a slow start. But I think by by the second half, they'll, they'll be playing pretty well. Um, it, it's going to be a difficult ride because, I mean, there's maybe like 11 or 12 teams in the East that I think are, you know, playoff caliber, at least in theory on paper. And compare that to the West, and, you know, I don't think the West is really all that strong, to be honest. So it's kind of a, a weird situation for the Flyers where, you know, I could see them being one of the 16 best teams and not make the playoffs because the East is so concentrated. Um, the West maybe has the better high-end teams, but the East is a deeper conference. So it'll be tough, but I, I think the Flyers will ultimately do it. I think I think the improvement of the goaltending is going to go a long way. I think enough guys are going to bounce back, and I do think they'll they'll find a way in. I'm, I, I'm picking them to uh, to sneak into a wild card spot, Dan. Yeah, I I think they'll make the playoffs. It, it I think that there's three main assumptions that I'm kind of making that would go along with them making the playoffs. And one is is you know Charlie's harped on as we all know to the case is to be the case is Carter Hart's got a rebound right like he's. Uh, the way he's played so far this preseason in his few appearances, he's got to carry that over to the regular season. Um, I think we kind of know, I think we know what we've got in Martin Jones. He's, you know, having him on my fantasy team in the last two years, he's exceedingly streaky. I mean, he's going to have games like his first preseason game this year where he lets in goals where you're like, how in the world did he let that in? And then he's also going to make some really good saves and have some good stretches. He's a very streaky goaltender. Uh, maybe he can get back to where he was three years ago where – He's very good for the most part, but I'm not counting on it. So I think, you know, we'll have ups and downs for Martin Jones. We need Carter Hart to, uh, you know, be where he was two years ago or take a step forward from where he was two years ago. So that's assumption number one. Assumption number two is that Sean Couturier stays, stays healthy. You know, they, they kind of had to sign into a contract to signify, um, you know, where they are with this team. And also, if Sean Couturier is not on this team, I mean, you look at the center position and it's just a dumpster fire. So they kind of had to sign him to that long-term deal. Um, he's got to stay healthy. I mean, he's had some knee problems over the course of his career. He hasn't necessarily been injury prone, but an injury to him, you know, would be sort of like a death knell to this team. So he's got to stay healthy. So you've got Hart, you've got Couturier. And then the other one, which is a little bit scary to me, is Ryan Ellis has got to stay healthy. Uh, and for the most part, he tends to miss about 20 games a season. So if, cause if Ellis isn't there, then you've kind of gotten back to a defensive situation that you were last season, unless a guy like Cam York can really stabilize things. So I think that, you know, having that top pair of Ellis and Provrov is going to be massive for this team. Um, and so I think those three things, Hart, Couturier and Ellis, those are kind of like the three key guys for me for the Flyers this season. And I think that assuming that things, generally go as predicted for those guys i think that this is a playoff team and then they can you know look to add at the deadline to kind of buoy them into maybe a team that can make a deep run into the playoffs because i do think that the potential is there for it i think that morgan frost has gained could gain his confidence in the ahl and come up and and be a you know be a a passable 5v5 
center to, you know, third line center and could excel on the power play. I mean, that's where his bread's really going to be buttered to me is the kinds of things that he can do on the power play. You know, when we had Charlie on about a month ago, we talked about how the team wanted a different look on the power play in terms of changing from like a shoot first mentality with a guy like Shane Gostas bear on the point to more of a pass first mentality and a guy who's kind of uh, running a fluid power play where, you know, he can make the decision on passing or shooting. And we've seen that already from, from Keith Yandel. So I think that the power play is going to be much improved. And I think that's going to be a big deal for this team. The, the PK has got to improve a little bit, but you know, I, I'm I'm bullish on this team. I uh, I embarrassed myself last year by predicting they'd be like a, a cup type of team last year, and they just uh, were about the opposite of that last year. But um, you know, I I think they'll be a playoff team this year with the potential for a lot more. And um, yeah, that's kind of where I am right now. Yep, but I'm the guy that wanted Reinhardt, not Ristolainen. I'll just remind everybody, but. <laughs> Use that first round pick to get Sam Reinhardt. All right, Charlie, um, <laughs> we're going to get you out of here. Um, you have another show to record. We appreciate you taking the time. Uh, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, where? Yeah, any final thoughts? And uh, tell the people where what your social media coordinates are. Yeah, sure. Um, don't really don't really think I have any final thoughts uh, other than you know thanks again for for having me. It was uh, it's good to uh, good to be back on the show. Good to chat with you guys. Um, obviously, um, I think most people probably know this, but I write for The Athletic, um, which is obviously a subscri- subscription-based site. We're running a 50% off deal if you want to check it out. Um, and if you're going to check it out and you like uh, my presence on social media and whatnot, it would be much appreciated if you subscribe via one of my articles so I get credit for it. Um, also, uh, the um, my my Twitter handle, you know, if you're if you're more of a, uh, a non-Twitter person, uh, Charlie. O underscore C O N N. So Charlie O underscore con. Um, and obviously I also, uh, am a weekly participant on the BSH radio podcast, which we will be recording in a half an hour. So, uh, so those are uh, the places you can, uh, you can find my stuff. And, uh, and obviously, you know, I try to answer as many people's questions on Twitter as I can. So if you, uh, if you have any flyers related questions, I will do my best to, uh, to respond. Terrific. And, and by the way, really yeah. quickly on the athletic, like it's to me, it's almost like incomprehensible that like Flyers fans wouldn't have subscriptions to the athletic just for Charlie's content, because you're talking about like the cost of like a cup of coffee a month. And just for Charlie's content, you're getting like, you know, thousands upon thousands of words per week of of great analysis on the Flyers, in addition to every other sport, fantasy football, fantasy hockey, you name it. So, you know, the, the athletic uh subscriptions are a complete no brainer to me. So Absolutely. Hey Dan Dan, you, you said it, not me. So I'll, yeah. I'll let, I'll let you guys <laughs> No, I, I I was uh, I was reading about the Fury Wilder fight on the athletic and great reporting there. But make sure when you do subscribe to the athletic, make sure it's right from one of Charlie's articles. Cha ching. So um <laughs> Charlie, thanks again. Yeah, you got it. Thanks, thanks guys. Charlie. All right, take care. All right, Dan, let me get your info uh, so we can get rolling here. Yep. Yeah, so fans can follow me on Twitter at DSilver88, and uh, feel free to argue with me on there. You know, I've got some good opinions, some bad opinions, throw in your opinion, and uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm just excited, honestly, to, uh, to, to, I'm going to the Eagles game Thursday night. I'm going to the Flyers home opener Friday night. I'm going to the Flyers Kraken game Monday night. And then I'm going out to Vegas for the uh, Eagles Raiders game. So I've got a lot of uh, Philadelphia sports events coming up. I'm fired up about. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We talked about that last time. Yeah. So we're probably going to do a show on Sunday. Dan, I don't know if you can make that one. Maybe Chef will st- step in for you. But we'll, we'll see how it works out. But uh, yeah, I, might be, I'm, I might be around yeah. Sunday night. I am going to do one thing before we go. I am going to do, and it's not always popular. I'm just going to make, I think it's important that at least one of us makes a prediction. I think the Flyers are going to sneak into a wild card spot. I think your semifinal will be the Florida Panthers defeating the New York Islanders. I think in the West, it's going to be the uh, Avalanche beating the Gold, the Vegas Golden Knights. They still need a center. I think Colorado Avalanche are going to beat the Panthers and win the Cup this year. So I'm on record. You can... You can talk to me about that uh, at Isaiah at I S A I A H 
underscore 520 at Isaiah. Don't forget the underscore 520. I'm not going to give any cup predictions. I embarrassed myself last year with the Flyers prediction. But um, well, you, you know. win a you win a gambling table. They say you win when it really counts. When you put your I money do. where your mouth is. No, I I do I do, and so uh, you know we'll we'll see what happens this year. But yeah, absolutely. So one of us made a, a prediction, and and don't forget Jim South Street, 400 South Street, 40 years of the best cheesesteaks, hoagies, with or without it doesn't matter. And if you live down there, you know they use DoorDash. There's no excuse. You gotta get the best cheesesteak. Jim South Street, 400 South Street. And until next week, people, let's enjoy that Vancouver Canucks. Let's, let's go Flyers. Let's win that first game. Get off to a great start. And after that, we'll see you on Sunday night. And until then, take care.